Good uh, afternoon, everyone. Um, good evening. Um, good night uh, in in uh, in Australia. Uh, we have people all over the world, and I'm happy to host today in the series on theories of regulation and government governance. One of the leading scholars on um, regulation and governance, uh, a pioneer and uh, uh, scholar, uh, somebody who would uh, always look at admiring her uh, work. Professor uh, Julia Black is a CBE, as said, the commanding officer of the British uh, uh, Empire. She's also fellow of the British M Academy. She will be in from July the 34, 31st uh, president of the British Academy. Uh, for the humanities and the so social sciences. She is one of the leading, um, uh, let's say, uh, managers or leaders of the London School of Economics. And she also a leading scholar on uh, regulation, the legitimacy of uh, uh, regulation, uh, the structure and the uh, polycentrism in, 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 uh, in regulation. She specializes in financial service uh, regulation and regulation of risks. So welcome, um, uh, Julia. Um, we are happy to have you with us. Let me put you in the spotlight. Uh, thank you, Julia. And the topic of today is regulatory dynamics and uh, dynamics of regulation. Shall we start um, immediately with the first question, Julia? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so what, what, what do you mean by regulatory dynamics and dynamic uh, regulation? What? Okay, so this is um, so this is something that we all we all think about in different ways, and it's trying to really always sort of pull together, understand, analyze, crystallize, describe, uh, critique, etc., how regulatory systems are are working, how they actually operate, what their di so in other words, what their dynamics are. Um, and that's one of the, that's the thing that kind of brings us all together, that's the things that animates us. And so what I have been um, conscious of through, through lots of um, years of looking at regulatory systems and working in regulatory systems is that often we focus on one little, one particular area of those dynamics. So we might be looking at, uh, we often look at tools, we often look at kind of techniques, technologies, regulation, or we might be looking at how is, um, how the how the relationships between those who are you know part of a kind of a regulatory system loosely defined um interacting are they interacting in ways which are competitive or collaborative they are in kind of network relationships or in hierarchical relationships um or we're looking at um kind of trust and accountability so what are we how does you know what, what what's the trust and accountability is is this appropriate is it valid um and we're also often looking at how do we, um, you know, what's gone wrong. And so I was particularly, and I've always sort of focused on that. And as you go through various bits of regulation going wrong, then that's great because that really prompts you to sort of really challenge your own assumptions. And for me, one of the, um, the big challenges to assumptions and the big challenges to uh, where, the, where the kind of theoretical literature was going at the time, including, including my own mind, uh, and my own thoughts was the financial crisis. So I work in I work in areas of different regulation. I specialise in financial services regulation because I think it's good for me personally to have a domain specific uh, expertise. Um, and basically, the financial crash, which was some time ago now, um, was an example of pretty much every single style of regulation that you wanted to have, uh, where how it was organized, whether it was organized functionally, whether it was organized through Twin Peaks, whether it was organized through a unified system, whether you had self-regulation, whether you had command and control, whether you had management-based regulation, whether you had principles-based regulation, whether you had blah, 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 blah risk-based, et cetera, et cetera. You had all of those going on and they all failed. Great. So regulation scholar, fantastic. Where did you go from here? Right, we had independent regulators, we had regulators that were close to government, they all, you know, uh, seemed to be lacking, legitimacy was lost uh, across the whole piece. So it's a really good call to go back to the drawing board, as it were, and to think, okay, let's really start to take apart the dynamics of regulation and understand 
you know, with what, what happens when things go wrong. So then I did a, a project on regulatory disasters because I decided to really depress myself um, to analyze, well, which bits are, what's not aligning here. And so from that, I pulled together a framework of really taking the core elements of a regulatory system um, to, to, to really try to then pull it apart. Why? Because then you can, we can start to sort of see, well, when we're analyzing one part, then, we can have to be contact uh, cognizant of the of the context, the wider context, okay, of, of, of in which that particular part may be operating, whether it's a, a regulatory technique or a structure, etc. Um, and so, and then I've always so that was animating, and then the other thing that's sort of been animating and and has been a question which has been in my mind for quite a long time was. Um, somebody years and years and years ago, who was from India actually, uh, came into my office at the NSC at the time. So I am really interested in, in healthcare system in India, great, I know nothing about it. And he said to me, I really want to be able to sort of just analyze the regulatory system for healthcare in India. And for some reason, I don't know why, if all the multiple conversations I've had in the years and hundreds of people have been to my office, this one kind of stuck in my mind. And so where I've come up with, and I'll just share with you quickly now, is this, this framework. So, um, in terms of thinking about these different elements of a, a regulatory system. And what I was going to propose to do is just to, to canter through them quite quickly, and then we can have a conversation about whether or not they're remotely useful, really. Um, so let me just try to do that again, as we go through to see what, um, um, which of these elements is, is really gonna help us, let's say, to, to try and understand and map um, and analyze then the dynamics of regulatory systems as it were um, and in terms of how we can take that forward right let me just see if i've got enough decluttering now of my screen to be able to share something sensible with you so these as i say came out of oh well just uh you know, a lifetime so far, professional lifetime in thinking about regulation and analyzing regulation and reading, reading a, a lot of incredibly, in that incredibly rich literature, which is, is, has been rapidly growing up, thankfully, over the last 25 years or so. Um, to have a look at these different elements of regulatory systems and just to sort of try to understand them. Um, and then I've been applying this in different ways, loosely, usually more in, in practice or um, with regulators who've been often coming to me saying, well, listen, we've got to be pro-innovation now, or we've got to be more dynamic, or we've got to be, um, you know, ready to receive new technologies, et cetera. How do we, how do we orientate ourselves um, in order to, to, to adjust to, to changing circumstances? And so these, these are my different elements. So I'll go through them and then we can talk about whether, as I say, this really adds anything to, to what we know or understand. So the first is if you're analyzing regulatory system. So the, the exam question here is how do we really understand a regulatory system and how it's working? Um, it's not really about how do we design it, but it could be used for that. But it's about how do we really understand and analyze it? And the, you know, start, you always start off that we with purposes, goals, and values. So, what do we? What is this system trying to achieve? And we know for a long time, you know, you've got the, the the correct market failure, but we've always known that it's never usually about that, or might be about that, but it's often about other things, about managing risk, it's about coordination, it's about allocation of scarce resources, etc. But we also know that in terms of the pathologies, as it were, of regulatory systems, that those purposes and goals might be incoherent, they might be conflicting. They might, um, uh, they might change too frequently or they might not change often enough. They might not, they might have been embedded as it were some time back um, in some piece of legislation. Meanwhile, the world has moved on, but regulators are left with mandates, legal mandates, which were telling them to achieve certain types of purposes, but the world has moved on. Utilities regulations are a really good example. It starts off in the white heat as it were of, 1980s market liberalization and, and gradually social purposes become accreted, et cetera, on top of that, but yet they've still got this underlying normative framework, which is, is no longer really um, fits the kind of political uh, expectations of a regime, which will take key very much into trust and legitimacy, but I'm going to come back to that one at the end. So 
got those purposes, goals and values, what are we trying to achieve? Um, and again, I should just sort of set out here that I've sort of done regulatory systems and I'm, there's, a, there's a, always a question mark about regulation, about whether it's actually working as a system and whether we're focusing on a particular regulatory agency or in fact, we are bringing our gaze out to focus on all the different elements of different regulatory systems, which are focused on that common task or problem. Uh, AI is a really good example. So in, just in the UK, there are at least six different bodies that claim themselves to be AI regulators within the UK, um, for example. So anyway, so you've got those different purposes, goals about it. And the second element, and this came, was uh, for me, one of the really, really strong insights from risk regulation and from financial crisis, but, but also in other areas, is the cognitive frameworks. What are the cognitive frameworks? How, how are those who are, um, and I'm talking here from a, a policy point of view, but, but also from around those involved in the, in the system, how do they understand the problem? What do they see the operation of the, the market to be? What do they see the operation of the risk to be? Where are they getting the information from? Um, so we've known in risk regulation about the, the politics of inclusion and exclusion. Uh, the, all the issues around science, for example, and the domination, dom, dom, uh, dominance of uh, scientific understandings in what are quite contentious uh, public policy issues uh, in terms of uh, risk regulation. And I think COVID, we'll probably come on to COVID, how can we not talk about regulation COVID, you know, has been a really interesting example of that. And I think what we had um, in the very, very early days, if we look back to just over a year ago, um, is a really good example of what psychologists um, uh, have the, as the duck rabbit problem. So if you Google duck rabbit, which you can probably do right now, uh, you'll see a picture come up. And for some people, that picture looks absolutely like a duck. And for others, it is absolutely a rabbit. Um, and what we had in the very early days when all the data was coming out of uh, Wuhan and coming out of China, was you had exactly the same data. Genomic sequencing happened very, very quickly. Um, but you had some people looking at that data and going, this is very much a SARS-like rabbit. And then you had other people, uh, particularly in the West going, this very much looks like a rabbit shaped flu. Uh, so in other words, it goes to what it is that we're familiar with in this context. Um, and actually obviously you know, as you, as how you define a problem and how you see the problem, then tells you how you're going to go and, and resolve, uh, how you're going to go and solve it. Um, but it's also based on sets of understandings and presumptions and heuristic biases and everything that we know from cognitive psychology about how you think people are going to behave, how you think people are going to respond, and that's both on the supply side and on the demand side, um, if it's in a market context or in different areas of behavior. So, so in other words, that, that abs so bringing up and really unpacking, um, I hate that word, but it's so goddamn useful, um, those kind of understandings. What are the different cognitive frames uh, that are being adopted here? That takes us straight into, well, assuming a, a fairly rational linear process of, of policy production, which is, is heroic assumption, but anyway, is clearly linked analytically at least to tools and techniques. So how you understand the problem is going to have to be how you're going to fashion those tools and techniques. And again, a lot, as I, as I said before, a lot of kind of focus on that, rightly so, in terms of analyzing this in terms of is it process-based regulations, the outcomes, is it risk-based, is it problem-based, is it, are we using management-based structures here, are we using uh, um, even organizational structures themselves can be tools of regulation and techniques of regulation, self-regulation, enhanced self-regulation, enforced self-regulation, whatever description we have of different forms of self-regulation, statutory, transnational, et cetera, et cetera. So huge amounts, so, but, Focusing on those, we know that how they how they really work is clearly context specific. And what's the rest? What's the context? The rest of this framework here, the thing that really determines how they operate, comes into or starts off in relation to the knowledge, ideas, and understanding, but then really comes flows through to behaviors of individuals and the dynamics of organisation. And these are these are enormous. Right? These are you know basically social science, just writ large, isn't it? Just encompassed in those two in those two kind of circles there. Um, and here again, when we analyze regulatory systems, we know that we've got 
whether we're looking at behaviors of bureaucracies or regulators of bureaucracies, or whether we're looking at behaviors of firms and individuals within firms, or about individuals within any of these contexts, or behaviors of consumers um, in that market context, that we made huge strides in that understanding. However, this is, you know, how people behave is the core question, one of the core questions of social science. So we're not really going to be able to um, have definitive answers, obviously, as regulatory scholars, but we can, there's a wider kind of acceptance of, of the complexities of those individual behaviors and how they interact with, um, you know, tools and techniques, whether it's in terms of adopting strategies of creative compliance or management incentives, etc. But just here, just taking them as, as a core element that we really need to, to focus on to understand the dynamics how the system is working. That then plays into dynamics of organizations. A lot of difficulty, obviously, then separating out individuals and organizations. Lots of literature on that, don't need to go into. But talking here about those structures and processes. So, and if you're talking in institutional literature language, then it's around, it is around processes, it's about uh, documentation, it's about um core dynamics of different groups within organizations and remember i'm thinking about regulators as well as as well as regulators or uh, others who might be involved as, as intermediaries or as third parties or as, um uh, within the system both as themselves but the interactions between them so it's both intra organizational dynamics and inter organizational dynamics and that's where it gets us into how you um how regulate that partly also gets us into the, the structural relationship. So are they in a, a network and how does that affect the dynamics? Is it in a hierarchical? How does that affect the dynamics collaborative and so on and so forth? Again, you know, huge area of focus. And what I'm not saying is that every time you look at a regulatory regime, you've got to tick off each one of these boxes, right? Because otherwise we'd just be writing encyclopedias the entire time. But it is to sort of at least be cognizant when thinking about a regulatory regime, which bit am I focusing on and which bit am I not? Um, and how and how do they interact? And then finally, um, it's not it is that really, really complicated question around trust and legitimacy. Um, both for state based regulators, uh, and we know all the debates there, absolutely for transnational and non state regulators. Um, I'm just thinking about how all of these different dynamics interrelate with that issue of trust and legitimacy. So clearly purposes, goals and values in terms of whether you are a regulatory regulator, any particular regulatory act or, or the system as a whole, to the extent we can define it, is seen as trustworthy and legitimate. Uh, in other words, as having the right to govern. Um, and for some that will be grounded in, in the normative values its overall aims and purposes. Uh, for some that will be grounded in its kind of functional efficiency, tools and techniques, you know, do they know the market? Are they efficient? Are they expert? Um, for some that will be grounded in the processes, you know, is it fair? Is it open? Is it transparent? Is it um, deliberative? Is it participatory? Does everybody, does everybody have a, um, a voice who should be having a voice, et cetera. And so that issue about trust and legitimacy, which is, is you know underpins as it were the 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 ability of the the all the system or organizations within it ultimately to survive whether they're state-based or whether they're they're self-regulatory or not so that's really where i've been sort of thinking about um in terms of how you can think about a regulatory system as having these different elements now in this, I've had lots of different iterations and various, and it, this is a process of selection. So certain things have been kind of screened out or sort of deprioritized uh, or merged with other things as thinking about it. So communication, for example, is clearly a core element uh, coming across power dynamics, you know, cut across, uh, et cetera. Um, but in terms of this framework, this is where I've sort of been going out. Well, now when I, I have been using it is talking to regulators who have been, for example, saying, well, we need to sort of drive towards innovation, or whatever, is taking them through and saying, okay, well, you know, each one of these areas kind of has to be primed, as it were, for um, for, for, for innovation and responding um, in a dynamic way, it's the dynamics of dynamic regulation, um, to to changes in, in their environment, uh, widely conceived. So anyway, I'm going to stop there.
because yeah, I, so, I, I don't so, know so maybe, but maybe just to sort of set that out. Maybe um, you can um, just summarize in a few, few words, few sentences. What, what is really regulatory dynamic and what is dynamic regulation? What are the differences before moving into the issue of, uh, you know, the value added of this uh, framework or, or, or terms or concepts? Uh, so regulatory dynamics are the, uh, this is constantly moving. Right. I mean, I can't do the animation because I, you know, I don't, I, my children at university, so they're not on hand basically to animate my slides more. Um, but all of these things are constantly shifting. Okay. So this is, so that's, so that's about, um, that's about dynamic regulation, even when it's static, it's not dynamic as a, as a, as a forward, you know, front of, uh, front of charge kind of regulatory system is that even those that are, are static are, you know, we'll have people that they do have a, 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 a movement element to them, they are alive. Um, and regulatory dynamics is, so the dynamics of regulation are that those, dy those dynamics comprise all of these different elements, as it were. So it is the interaction of all of these different elements mm -hmm. which give you, which constitute the regulatory regime on a continual basis. So what is the value added uh, or why develop this framework? Um, what do we see with it that we don't see uh, via other framework, including yours? Yeah, no, absolutely. So I'm. So what? So I think you know, very fair question. And as I said, you know, what does this add? And to, and it may be that the only thing, the only person who finds this of any value is me, um, which would be fair enough. Um, but, but genuinely, I think for me, what it does is it. Um, if we were to take it. It, it helps us to, to provide a sort of a, an analytical framework to quite complex, often polycentric, as I've talked about in the past, regulatory systems, and to understand the interdependencies of all those different elements. So in other words, you know, if we're focusing on tools and techniques, for example, then to really understand how they are, they do behave or they are being used, why they might be used, we have to think about, well, what's the problem set that they're What's the understanding that they're based on? What are their goals? Are they oriented towards achieving? Are they the right ones? How are they being maneuvered? How are they being uh, developed and deployed in the constant iterations uh, and enactment and performance of the, of the system through the behaviors of individuals, the dynamics of organizations, and how does all of this add up to make trust and legitimacy? And as I say, you can't necessarily look at each one of these in depth in relation to every regulatory system that would, you know, one might want to, but one doesn't have to, to be the highlighting each. So that's about it. It's about kind of facilitating analytical um, clarity. Sure. And I see comments here from uh, Melanie. She said, um, you know, for her, this is a, a system approach to regulation. Um, and, uh, but for anti systems uh, people, um, we would ask where is the, comparative elements where are the politics uh, of this system, the distrib distributive uh, elements. Um, and, and you say, yeah, please go on. Um, so again, fair, fair questions there. I and you're right in the sense that this is, um, in a way it, you know, is it to a, um, analytical and sort of stepping back from that very contested world of, of politics, you just say, where's the power dynamic in here? Where's the issue about inclusion and exclusion, et cetera. And for me, that, it, that, that permeates as it were through this, um, through this analysis. And as I say, I had long questions about whether I pull out power or not within this. But for me, that comes through the, the power dynamics at play in each one of these elements. So you've got power dynamics at play in how goals are chosen, right? And who gets to have a voice, whose goals get to dominate as it were, and who gets, whose goals get to be those that are defined as being the ones that should be pursued and the values uh, be pursued. You've absolutely got power dynamics in the framing, the cognitive framing of a problem. Um, and as I say, you know, we learn a lot from risk regulation in that in terms of what is seen as a bad outcome, even what is defined as a bad outcome that we want to avoid, um, and, and therefore how that gets defined in and how that gets um, 
screened out. So there's a power dynamic at play there. There's obviously power dynamics in terms of uh, behaviors of individuals, dynamics of organizations, et cetera. So, um, so I think one can, it, that you can use this framework absolutely in a, in a very kind of stand back, objective, analytical way, but I think it's very difficult to actually hold on to that if you are really going to be trying to, to look at actually those dynamics, you have to capture those, those power dynamics. And I think it also gives you an insight into points of inclusion and exclusion. So where do people get included and where do different groups get excluded through this process? Um, and who's doing the including and the yeah. excluding? I think, I think it can accommodate that. Yeah, I'd like to draw your attention to the chat box and to a question. Oh, right. okay. um, a uh, question by yeah. Pedro. Uh, Pedro Baptista says, or writes, all those levels could be presented as reasons why regulation is not dynamic. So there is a lot of check uh, there, and the checking of the box is a way to turn dynamism uh, good and legitimate, but not necessarily enhancing uh, only dynam dynamism. Uh, so this is a comment uh, maybe you want to refer to it. Uh to other questions uh, in the meantime, or, or, shall, or we can go to the sorrow issue um, of the talk. Yeah, no, so listen, it's a bit of a play on words, right? So it's a title, it's a title to get you drawing and, and click, click. That's, that's a bit of a cheap response. Um, yes, they could also be actually the reasons that it's not, sort of regulation isn't dynamic in the sense. So I'm using dynamic in very, very dictionary sense or something which is constantly moving. Yeah. Um, and everything, even though all social life is constantly moving. So it's kind of says nothing, says everything and says nothing, uh, but not in the sense of it being a normative, you know, positive, good quality, as it were, of a regulatory regime. In fact, it may be that through the behaviours of organisations, the dynamics uh, of individuals, the dynamics of organisations and misplaced cognitive framework, outdated goals and values, that actually this is, a, this is a, an inert regulatory regime, as it were, in the sense that, a lot of people are doing stuff, right? Um, but it's not actually dynamic in the sense it's not keeping up with uh, what it is it needs to achieve. So is yeah, I would absolutely take that point. Yeah. Is it uh, merely an analytical uh, framework or uh, does it have a normative dimension? The question by in Ingrid uh, Schneider. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so for me, I think it has, it is primarily an analytical framework, but it can never be completely value free. Why not? Because you've got values kind of deep you know fundamentally embedded in there does it then enable you through an analysis to then give a critique as it were of a regime from different perspectives whether it's functional whether it's democratic or whether it's do on on those different criteria i think it gives you a, it gives you a, it gives you a uh, a way in as it were to making those normative assessments depending on how you want to be assessing the regime but it's not it's not it can never be value free in the sense but what you are taking there is a difference between the imminent imminent values, so the, the values within the organ, within the system that mm -hmm. uh, are in play and may well be contested, as and so versus or as as opposed to the values of, of the academic observer, critique, whoever it is who's standing outside of the system looking in. So there's the insider outsider perspective there on different values. I think yeah. to capture that. Uh, there is a comment there uh, from Didre Norris, uh, and I, will, I, I would agree, Didre, that uh, it, it can be a wonderful uh, framework to, to, to analyze technologies, destructive technologies. Uh, as a matter of, of uh, fact, uh, Julia and Andrew Mori uh, published recently, to now, uh, 2019, um, a paper on regulating AI, which is also uh, partly the basis of this talk. So have a look at uh, Julia and Andrew's uh, paper. Now, um, the, the, the question is, uh, you know, when you speak about regulatory regime, Julia, I'm thinking about, um, for example, uh, Christopher Wood uh, book on risk regulation, where he, you know, very, tech, very meticulously, very, in very detailed form uh, did, um, uh, a regulatory regime uh, analysis, uh, distinguishing between regimes content and regimes uh, orientation and so on. Would you go this way? This is the same kind of way of thinking about regulatory regime? 
or this is something more comprehensive? Uh, so listen, it's kind of aligned, and I often nick the description of a system or a regime um, for convenience's sake, and I have a, a note on the, the kind of, you know, whenever I get back to is to is to really think in, through, as it were, to what extent it's systems and regime. But there's certainly something without it, within that, but in the sense, however, that I use it in the, in the kind of the way that I think about policy, the polycentric analysis, which is you've always got multiple players, right? It's never just a question of having a regulator or a regulatory agency and a bunch of firms as regulators, right? It's never, um, even in what looks to be the most kind of monocentric, you know, reg, uh, state-based regulatory regime, you will always have more players than that, not least because you'll have accountability actors, you'll have advisors who are advising regulated firms, you'll have a bunch of, you know, a bunch of intermediaries, you'll and moreover, because often, well, increasingly so, regulation is nested in globe, multinationally and or globally. And so you'll always have that nesting. Um, and so there is, there is a sense of that, but it is really taking that and, and analysing it further, as it were, with a very much a regulatory lens. Yeah. yeah. So uh, there, there are, uh, you know, uh, comments, yeah. questions from Jonathan Zeitlin and Suzanne. Uh, Susan Sil Silby, uh, why don't you come and ask them? Uh, you can al also read, but uh, Jonathan, let's see you. I miss yeah, you. Yeah, here, here I am. Uh, can you see? Hi, Jonathan. Hi, Julia. Very nice to see you. Thanks for the presentation. So I, I wanted to bring you back to one of the yeah. things you said at the very yeah. beginning, which was about the uh, <laughs> global financial crisis and how that basically showed that all of our existing models of regulation had failed, um, at least in that, uh, that sector. And so I wanted to ask you, assuming you're still following things to the same extent, I mean, there's been an explosion of reforms at, at all levels, uh, you know, uh, global, uh, EU level, national level. Um, which, if any of these, do you consider to be uh, promising, at least in addressing the kinds of problems that were highlighted by the, the financial crisis? Yeah, the financial crisis. Oh, it's a really good question. How I, long have you got, I, John? I might say the single supervisory yes, mechanism in banking union, which I'm studying, is pretty interesting. And then I would ask you, once you've answered that, how that fits with your framework. Does your framework yeah. help you to identify which would be uh, the, the promising reforms mm -hmm. and why. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so listen, so I, um, I, I live financial regulation <laughs> because I'm, I'm now uh, a part-time regulator actually. So I, so, and so I now have to put in my exclusion, which is I am a, uh, a member of the Bank of England's uh, Prudential Regulation Authority Committee, which regulates the UK's banks, building societies and life insurance companies and everything I say from now on and, and have said so far is in my personal capacity, not as a representative or blah, blah, blah. Uh, so you've had the terms and conditions. Um, so absolutely, Jonathan. And as I say, just how long have you got? Because <laughs> I could sit and talk about this for a long, awfully long time. But if I so to start off, I will use my framework to go through. So goals and values. I think one of the things it you know, caused quite a, um, and it will all come back to kind of cognitive shifts, but also goals and values. Um, in terms of the values being clarified, particularly around, around banking regulation and super, um, stability, which is around stability, system stability, right? We, um, and in order to do that, but also what was then, so there's some goals and values there, which is also then in some cases, and certainly in the UK's case, and different shifts happening in, in the EU of a downplaying of the value of ensuring the competitiveness of your industry. Okay, so less industrial policy, more stability. Um, we can have debates about how the EU is now playing uh, the, the debate around equivalence and weaponizing that as an instrument of in, in, industrial policy, but we'll, we'll come back, that, that's not relevant here. So then as I go around, massive shock on the, on the, on the cognitive framework. Okay, lots written about that, don't need to go back through that. Two particular things to highlight. The first is that you don't get the system stability of the whole by focusing on, on the stability of each individual part. So you have the invention of macro prudential regulation, core part of the SSM kind of. Uh, so for those who aren't familiar with financial regulation, uh, the single site supervisory mechanism uh, in the EU is for um, major EU 
banks um, whose, uh, if they were to collapse, could have a systemic knock-on implication for financial stability for other EU countries. So smaller banks and building societies are regulated at, at the member state level, competent authority level. The larger ones are, are regulated at by the, SS, uh, by the SSB. Um, so you've got that kind of absolutely, uh, that sort of having a look at that macro prudential uh, viewpoint. That I think is, is first point, which I would, I would just sort of highlight in terms of radical shift in thinking about regulation and then how you, how you perform regulation. The second, I would say, is, around, is about risk. And for me, it's scenario analysis. Um, and there has been a burge, there's a really, really interesting area of development, again, at Brown Cognitive Framing. And so what um, central bank regulators, like myself with a different hat on, um, spend time doing now is thinking about what would make the system fail. Um, and working and then, and then testing out, as it were, the resilience of the system against these different scenarios. Now, interestingly, when in devising those scenarios, we're not actually worried about creating narratives of why all these bad things might happen. It's just saying a range of bad stuff might happen. We don't know how, we don't know why, but let's just, if GDP went down by X percent at the same time that we had a currency do X, at the same time that a bunch of other stuff happened. So it has to be severe, but quite plausible scenarios. And this is rolled out, and this is a very new element of financial services regulation. It's rolled out now across central banks, it's rolled out across critical market infrastructure, clearing houses have to have multiple severe but plausible scenarios. It's kind of come in a little bit from insurance under solvents, under, I don't want to get too technical, but anyway, under insurance regulation, insurers have to have models based on multiple scenarios. And I think it's it's that, it's so for me that, that, that second shift is um, around, again, that cognitive framing of how we perceive the risk or a problem and recognizing that we need to be, uh, we need to open up the black box of models on which so much financial regulation is based and really test them against these different things. And finally, there have been different organizational shifts. Uh, we've had that within the, the, the SSB mechanism. Uh, we've had that within the UK. We've had that in different uh, organizational arrangements of financial regulation. And I think absolutely then what the framework does is it goes into, okay, okay, how are those organizational processes working from inside and how what are the behaviors of individuals, et cetera, et cetera. So I could go on, but there's a lot in there. There's a lot in there, John. Absolutely. So let, let's uh, move on because I want to, I'd like to go to the COVID uh, situation uh, um, or context from the financial crisis to the COVID. But before we go to the COVID, um, you suggested um, a question that I'm happily, I'm happy to, to repeat. To what extent this framework helps scholars and practitioners to make uh, regulation more friendly, more innov innovative? Can it take uh, those big tasks, more friendly regulation, more innovative? What did you mean by those qualities? I um. So this is a, a this is a challenge we so often put to regulators, which is listen. You're always behind the curve, right? So you're always behind the market. You're always behind the technology. You're always behind, um, you know, generals fighting the last war, etc. And so one of the um, sort of challenges which has come out is in relation to emerging technologies. So so take a pit, whether it's platforms, whether it's um, AI, whether it's whether it's vaccines. Um, and is that you know, regulation has been set up at some point in time and it isn't able to adapt. Um, so adapting the systems of energy regulation, for example, where you assume there are just a few massive producers all feeding into one grid, you know, don't easily adapt to even the production of small amounts of electricity on an intermittent basis by people that are in solar panels selling surplus of energy back into, back into the grid, for example. They don't fit in terms of resiliency, they don't fit in terms of licensing, they don't fit in terms of pricing. So the call has, has, is always for regulators, and certainly it is at the moment for regulators to be more, more innovative. And so where I've been working with regulators or some regulators with this is to 
is to actually help them do a self-diagnosis, as it were, of their own position within the, the system and, to, and looking out to the market in terms of, you know, are there what still what are their goals and values? Um, you know, where are we? And, and particularly in risk often around precautionary principle, we know those debates, but, you know, reiterating them, rethinking them um, in this particular context, um, moving through kind of the understanding again of the problems, moving through the appropriateness of the tools and techniques, moving through the dynamics of individuals, our understanding of the market, et cetera, et cetera, training skills, capacity, moving, moving, do you see what I mean? Moving around those different elements. So for them, um, that's where it's 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 become mobilized or can be mobilized and ditto in in discussions around design now op clearly operation and design are, are moving in there and i'm also conscious here that that if that in the narrative and but not necessarily in the frameworks and think about that is has to always be this dynamic of, of the power element whether it's as, as there as ever as the kind of the industry dominance uh where are consumers in this you know producer risk consumer risk balance etc so that's what i mean about mobilizing this to uh in the context of a kind of a wider policy drive that there may be or expectations on regulators to become more innovation friendly thank you very much uh, julia um i'd like to move to the fifth big questions that we, we have uh, planned to do in this talk is what do you think uh, are the lessons from the COVID uh, situation? To what extent they are different from the lessons uh, or in, even in conflict from the lessons of, uh, of the financial crisis? And also maybe a normative um, assessment of the role of regulator in those two crises. Um, in yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so just on, on COVID, I'm just going sort to of see if I can catch a question on the chat as well. So I think one of the things COVID has, has shown us is the, you know, the, the response the response to COVID has been, has been clearly a medical response. There's also been a massive regulatory response um, through, you know, through, through different configurations of different lockdown measures. And I think what we, what has been exposed there are or multiple things, there'll be multiple theses written on this, I'm, I'm sure, going forward. One of the most clearly obvious things is just different societal attitudes to risk. Um, but partly attitudes to risk, but also ability to protect oneself from uh, risk. And I think as we look around the world, the, that what has become really, really obvious is our um, the differential ability of both peoples within particular within countries and certainly between countries to protect themselves from a health risk by basically taking on a massive economic risk um, and and watching countries navigate not just through um, so that's the first point and then that then how that plays out and again thesis will be written on this in terms of the response to risk. So in other words, to what extent, you know, politicians will, will always say we're following the science, but we all know from looking at science and policy making and looking at this regulation and how that plays out, that it never really works like that. Um, you know, political choices are being made at every single step of the way. And so it's to tease out to what extent are those choices being governed by, you know, what are those choices being governed by? Are they going to be governed by, you know, what can a country afford? You know, within the Western world, we could, you know, we can afford to plow billions and billions and billions and billions of pounds into our economies to, to keep people afloat. Other countries can just simply, simply cannot afford to do that. So how can they possibly respond in the same way? So what are, how, how are choices around how to manage risks being made? What are the trade-offs that are being made in that process? Um, and we've seen so many different trade-offs being made between, um, you know, whether it's health, education, you know, lives, livelihoods and lockdowns, etc. So I think what we have is we have this incredible, um, you know, natural experiment, which is a fairly horrible thing to say about what's been the most, most devastating thing that I think any of our, anybody alive who hasn't been through a war has had to be through. Um, and to look 
at how different countries have responded, I think will give us actually huge amounts of really powerful material to think to to really understand the dynamics of science and policy making of policy making in science and of uh, risk regulation risk amplification etc cetera, etc cetera. so i think it's um there's a lot to be mined if it were there for us to understand thank you julia and i'd like to what to do now is to invite um comments uh, if possible short comments uh from few people um, and the more uh, brief you are or succinct, uh, the more people can uh, join. So who wants to, to go first? Uh, Pedro, please, or anyone? Yeah, I could, I could ask one. I was curious, especially about the role of technology in, in all the cycle, the tools and, and so on, and how technology can alter the rulemaking. So I was thinking maybe like um, uh, uh, in, in, increase experimentation in certain um, uh, like the sandbox experiments and so on, and uh, and then but then my concern was that if technology do play a bigger role, a lot of technology are kind of hyped. They are sold as solving many issues and they don't really deliver in the end. So I was a, a little bit worried on like how regulators are able to measure the promise of technology. And, and then that like, yes, sorry, Thank I will you. get too long. Thank you. Uh, Julia, in, let's, let's hear mm -hmm. other people. Mel yeah, yeah, absolutely. Do you want to go? Anyone, Malcolm? I would like. Yes, please go okay. on and Malcolm after you. Who is, who is you? Just please. Hi. Hi, thank you very much for, for a very interesting talk. I was wondering, it seems that the framework can be relevant to other policy fields as well. As well. Can you say something about the regulatory uh, specification of this framework? Yeah, no, I think so. Just, I, like, uh, Julia, yeah, yeah, just, yeah, just yeah. write it down. Yeah. Others, others, we want to, to have more people coming in. Yep, Jonathan, do you want to go? I see that you you wrote a message, but I don't have time to to read. Maybe you can uh, uh, speak out, Jonathan. Yeah, but I was just follow. Thank you. I was just uh, following up uh, on what I had said before to try to identify what I thought were the innovative features of the the single supervisory mechanism for, for banking union and to relate them to Julia's framework. But I, I mean, I've written it out in the chat. I don't think uh, I should okay. uh, present it now. Thank you. Okay, so one more. So if not, uh, Julia, please go on. Yeah, okay, so um, so uh, technology and uh, and regulators sort of technical, well, I suppose technology for lock-in and and what technology should they be using themselves? I think that was questioned in terms of their, their regulatory uh, their regulatory processes. So um, I think one of the key things here is is really about is is technical understanding and expertise. So one of the issues that's coming through uh, very strongly it might be around blockchain, but it might be around smart rule writing, uh, having also um, also fulfilling rules, as it were. Um, in terms of reg tech. Um, so there's a bunch that are there about reg tech and there's a bunch there also about regulators using, uh, for example, AI themselves to be making, uh, to be doing analysis, uh, et cetera. I think one of the major, major concerns there is, is really for regulators to be very, very good procurement. Do they really understand what it is that they're buying? And also is their framework for using that, that, that technology uh, absolutely consistent and aligned with the values, um, again, trust and legitimacy. I've seen this increasingly in relation to particularly the use of AI um, in, in the non in the non-consumer space. So whether it's in terms of facial recognition by police, for example, whether it's in terms of forensic investigation, um, and so on and so forth, or using uh, neural network models, for example, in the context of uh, money laundering to try and identify where you where you got suspected activity. So I think this is a this is a huge conversation which needs to be very very urgently had. Um, 
And I think one of the, the as I say, just a, just a very basic issue, but it comes back to skills, understanding, expertise, and being massively outgunned uh, in terms of industry, usually for all the reasons that regulators are often massively outgunned. Um, but actually also, however, having the opportunity there, I think there really is an opportunity uh, for regulators to, to do a lot more collaborative learning uh, from one another. It sounds a bit trite, but, but, I, but, but I think none of that's true. In terms of just conscious of time, the regulatory specification, so the specification of the framework for, for regulators, I mean, it's, it is quite generic. If you look at other different policy frameworks, they'll pick up similar things. I think where it comes out is, is in the, the particular task, regulatory, regulatory governance is a particular type of task, which is different from other forms, for example, of policy administration or organization, which is around the changing of behaviors uh, or the managing of risks through the changing of behaviors or the achieving of other things through the changing of behaviors. Um, which is to, and it's it's through that uh, it's through that change and through that different element of agency. There's more there there's, than I can unpack in this particular mode. But I agree from a generic, but I think in the way that it then gets, uh, you know, we are always focused on a particular problem uh, set or particular type of social dynamic, and I think that's where it gets its particular government flavor. Yeah. Um, so one question from. Uh, of mine and actually also for, for my uh, PhD students who just finished uh, Rota Medizini, one of your uh, great contributions were uh, the discussion of decentering regulation, really polycentric regulation. And as um, we are looking now at the, at the dynamic of the system, uh, my question to you, do you see um, more decentering, more polycentrism or, a return to monocentric uh, regulation. When you think about the regulation of uh, of the COVID uh, experience, and I would go and ask a, a, a different but connected question rega regarding the the lessons from the mixed result in in, in governing the platforms, internet platforms via enhanced self regulation. Um, where, where, where do we are, where are we in this regard from, from your point of view? Uh, starting with the dynamic of the system and then going to the platforms. <laughs> uh, so as I say, to me, regulation is always polycentric. It's just a question of degree. So, um, and there is, no, there is no world movement. You know what I mean? It's moving in different places, different ways, in different areas, different times, different countries. Um, uh, and then to the, uh, to, to the to the dynamics on the on the on platform um so really so you know jet, re, that's really interesting very trite but it's no less true um so i think what's what's interesting here is the state the areas where the state where states in different countries have decided to step in uh and areas where actually they haven't and platforms um have been Kind of left to get on with it uh, and one could argue whether that's a, an abdication as it were of state responsibility or not but but you know leaving that argument on one side for a moment so i think you've got um and again it varies across countries so you know europe is is you know basically a, the kind of the, the regulatory leader in some senses on data protection regulation if you go out to australia and different places just don't have the same level of protection in other countries um, at all um, and what you have there is a very strong kind of uh, role for the state, but cascaded down through designated offices within firms, your DPOs, your controllers. You know, quite a quite an integrated and uh, in, 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 intricate kind of Russian doll model, as it were. You know, of of kind of, kind of regulation coming up, and then one can argue about the different capacities of regulators and the resourcing of of. Of, of regulate of, of ICOs and equivalents in different countries and how uh, because of the, the market choices of firms you end up with uh, quite powerful regulatory actors in particular countries because of the way the market is driven that's at Ireland for example uh, in data regulation um, which might not necessarily match the capacity so you find it's doing the job for you know more countries than it but it's a, anyway so there's, there's a whole dynamic there but I think in if we were to look at um, you know, clearly on content regulation, then you've got a whole multiplicity. You know, you there what what you have is you have some some you have some yeah you have some law 
about you know, human rights and, and freedom of speech, etc., often reliant on private action, private legal actions, uh, to, uh, to to take those legal actions with all the drawbacks that the advantages and disadvantages that that has. Uh, but basically, platforms being left to to moderate content and being given and being told that that's what they have to do. Um, and so you've got a very different dynamic there where you don't have such a strong state presence. You, you basically have a, you, you guys go and sort it out. Um, and then you have a, again, within different jurisdictions, a kind of different concerns. So there are then moving forward, however, legislation coming through both the European level, uh, the UK level on in relation might be online harms or um, digital content, et cetera, but you've got them moving at different paces, yeah? In other words, so you've got, so you don't have a single speed, as it were, uh, which uh, speed is the right thing, but you don't have a single, uh, I suppose, pace at which the state wants to step in into these different areas. It's stepping in at different different times and different places as it grapples with the diff with the, the issues in different ways. And then obviously the cross-cutting in there is the, the economic dimension, the market dimension in relation to, to data and, and competition, or as it were, catching up with the fact that market power is not necessarily uh, always what what it had been seen to be and the need to sort of shift as it were even within within competition law as well the, the, the sense of what it, what it is to be dominant uh, and the role of data uh, in in defining that dominance so lots of kind of shifting moving parts in this and different parts of the state uh, in in different countries um, moving it in different in different ways um, on a bit of a scramble in some cases to try to catch up. So really, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Julia. There is uh, one last comments question from uh, Michael Levy. In the end, uh, if you can uh, read uh, it, uh, maybe I repeat it for the benefits of the video. Uh, one of the special problems of money laundering, right, uh, Michael, is that uh, it's very unclear where the level of laundering behavior uh, are. So we are all praying Play, pretend on the, on the certainty on, on, on money laundering uh, typologies or, or, or regulation. Um, and he ask, uh, can AI, artificial intelligence, really help with that? Um, any oh, no, I'm going to ask a question. So listen, I suppose, you know, if one, with my vast knowledge of different types of AI algorithms, you know, one of the, one of the questions there would be, to the extent one's using kind of decision tree analysis, which is if this, then that, if this, then that, which assumes that you know the patterns, okay, that plays into the kind of typology. Uh, to the extent that one moves from that and moves more into machine learning, you know, con then without any priors, as it were, and it's for the machine to work through, then there may be something to be done there. It's not, there's, there's a whole other space there, and to be honest, you need somebody who's much more, uh, can give you much more detail on the, the differences between neural network analysis and, and random forest uh, algorithms, design of algorithms than, than I can give you. But I think, um, so I'm going to leave it there because I could, I could waffle on uh, and probably not add any more content. Uh, don't add words, it works as well. But it's a really, it's a really, it's a, clearly it's a really pressing problem. Um, and again, I think it's somewhere where Actually, we need we need we need proper so we need to get people like the Alan Turing Institute in in with the anti money launderers in with in with in with to really uh, cut that one through. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Julia. I apologize. Uh, That's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Uh, so it's very 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 many thanks, uh, Julia, for the presentation for excellent presentation. Uh, many, many thanks for all of you who took part in this uh, seminar. The next one will be with Kari Koglianisi on uh, regulatory excellence. I will send an uh, email via the, the network on the, on the time. It's, uh, it's April 6, but uh, wait for my email. And in the meantime, uh, you're invited to visit uh, Julia's uh, papers, books, and work and um, go deeper into our theory of regulation. Thank you very much, Julia. Brilliant, thank you, Michael. Thank, thank you, David. You. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, everybody who asked me questions. And I'm sorry I couldn't answer all, them, all of them in the chat, but anyway, very good. And thank you very much, David, for organizing, it's brilliant. Thank, thank you. you. My pleasure. Bye-bye, have a nice day, evening.